Uh, I want to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Tri-Chairs. Uh, we were lucky enough to get to help um, work together to lead this project, and my name is Lori Stoft, and I'm the Dean of Marketing and Public Relations. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Viri Diana Martinez, and I am the Administrative Assistant to the Vice President for Learning Services. And good morning, I'm Ellen Reek, I'm a Professor of English. So I, uh, m the job we get to do is short and sweet. We want to thank you for being here. And um, if I could see from a show of hands, how many of you uh, work here at the college district somewhere? All right, thank you. And then by a show of hands, how many of you are partners to the college, either business industry, education, uh, nonprofit? Awesome. So I really, really appreciate all of you coming out. Um, we could not have done this uh, in any authentic way without a lot of feedback. We did surveys, uh, we have a little timeline up here, focus groups, workshops, uh, community feedback, uh, um, I'm forgetting things. We, we ha hosted some speakers in April, we've been all over the district, and uh, on behalf of the Tri-Chairs and Dr. Kaur, um, I thank you for not getting strategic planning fatigue. Thank you for sticking it out with us. Thank you for filling out one more online bubble survey. Uh, because without your input, um, this plan would not be powerful and it would not be actionable. So um, I thank you for being here and for participating. Um, this plan also could not have happened without leadership, um, and optimism and faith from the very top. I am so excited that our district governing board has been involved since the very beginning and I'd like to welcome Maria Chavoya to the stage. Well, I'm not that tall, Lori. <laughs> I wish. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's certainly a great day to be a matador today. So, um, okay. Well, uh, again, I'm Maria Chavoya, and I am a board member here at the college. Um, and I'm delighted to represent the board the district governing board, uh, and I'd like to thank you, th thanking um, the commitment to Arizona Western College and your commitment to this strategic planning process. It's been a long one, like Lori said. Um, it hasn't been easy, and it's involved everyone. So really from the bottom of my heart, and I know the rest of the board and Dr. Core and everybody really thanks everyone for their involvement, community, students, faculty, uh, staff, everyone. We could not have gotten here without you. Uh, fueled by your enthusiasm, the board dared to dream um, uh, of a future for our college and our region that extends prosperity to all. We do not make these commitments lightly. We understand the challenges ahead to realize our dream. It is not going to be an easy road. Um, we are confident we can achieve the vision with your continued engagement and focused efforts aligned to our strategic direction. We see this strategic plan as a roadmap to creating college, to creating college going communities that help our families and our region to prosper. We encourage you to continue on this journey with us. So it's not over yet, sorry. Um, President Core uh, recognized the power of strategic planning at the onset. Sorry, <clears throat> my voice seems to kind of squeak, so sorry. He understood that the planning journey would be a galvanizing activity for our college and our community. He has 
encouraged us throughout the process to think boldly, and boy, did he do that, um, and build on our past success. Um, it has not been easy for all board members, um, uh, but we are here. We have the most important ingredient to ensure our success of our strategic plan, a strong and energetic and compassionate leader. Please join me in welcoming President Daniel Cord to the stage. Thank you, Ms. Chavoya. This is a big day. This is a big day. How big of a day? I've got a suit on. <laughs> I not only have a suit on, I have a tie on. <laughs> and not just any tie. That is a one of a kind embroidered AWC tie. So this, this, this is limited use. Put that back in the closet after today. Yeah, yeah, so this, I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I'm thrilled uh, to be here. I'm thrilled at the turnout. And, um, you know, as we scrambled to add seats, I'll, I'll, I'll note we had um, 68 RSVPs for today. <laughs> you know who you are if you didn't RSVP. So we're like, oh, 68. Let's set it up with like just a few seats at each table so it doesn't seem so empty. Well, all right, all right. <laughs> Lesson learned. You know we'll have it set for 200 next time and we'll get 68, I know it. Um, but today is an important step, an important step on our journey uh, from good to great. Um, you've already learned that about 2,600 people 2,600 different people have participated in this process to date. And um, when we set out, that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to have all members of our communities participate. We wanted to hear from the folks in Parker, and, and this afternoon we'll be up in Parker. We wanted to hear from the people in South County, and tomorrow morning we'll be down in San Luis. And we wanted to re-engage in a very meaningful way with our community partners. And internally here at the college, I have clicking duties. Look at me now, huh? <laughs> All grown up with the clicker, with a tie on. Um, and internally, we wanted all voices. Regardless of what employee classification you, you belong or what, what, com, what campus site you served at, we wanted all voices to be heard and engaged in this process. And specifically, we wanted a focus on the student voice. From the onset, we, we made a concerted effort to make sure that we interacted with students and asked students what their frustrations were, what they liked about this institution, what aspirations they had for their community college. If we were going to improve the student experience, it was critical that we do what? Ask about the student experience from students. And we did that. We held true to that commitment. So, so thrilled that uh, Ms. Javoya and, and Ms. Abetta are, are, are both here, members of our governing board, because very early in this process, we engaged our district governing board, and their primary responsibility was to create, uh, help craft our mission and our vision. And very early in that process, we had a decision point. Were we going to create a mission specifically for the uh, approximately 11,500 students who attend classes here? Or are we trying to craft something much broader, a mission and a vision for the communities that we serve, the region that we served? And we, we, we discussed that, and very quickly we arrived at a, a much more ambitious, a much more overarching uh, mission and vision for this institution that is not just for the students who attend here, but our partners in the community, the businesses, the nonprofits, um, and, and the members of our community who have no affiliation with the college, what we aspired to be for those, 
for those folks. And let's, let's take a look at these, because they're powerful. And every word has specific meaning. Um, I know they're up on the screen. I know you can read them up on the screen. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read that mission to you anyway, because it, it is so powerful uh, to me. Trans I will read it once I put my glasses on. Transforming lives through education and partnerships to create thriving communities. And a vision that's even more powerful. I've, this is my 25th year in higher education, all at the community college level. I've worked at a variety of institutions, and I will, I will share with you that this vision for this community college is the most powerful vision that I have, I have ever been uh, associated with. And, and I will tell you, I'm excited and inspired by it. A vision for this institution that says we collectively will cultivate generations who valid, value knowledge, foster independence, eliminate poverty, and create vital and equitable and sustainable communities. Transform lives, eliminate poverty, create thriving, vital communities. That's some big stuff. That's some big thinking. That is aspirational. That is powerful. And I will tell you that, that, that two-word phrase, eliminate poverty, we, we, we discussed that a great deal. And it was the sense, how can we as an institution possibly you know, feel we can eliminate poverty in this community? Well, through education. That's how. And it, and it came down to a, a board member, and, and some of you have heard this story, a board member who had some, some, some doubt about the appropriateness of including eliminating poverty in, in our vision, had a conversation with a student. Just informal conversation and asked that student, what, what do you feel about this concept of including, the college including eliminating poverty? And that student said, I love it. I believe in that, I love it, because you know what? I'm poor, and my friends are poor. And we look to this institution as the vehicle that, that, will, that, that will move us out of poverty. That's what we look to the college for. And the light bulb clicked for that particular board member and became a very strong advocate for that term in, in, in our, our both mission and vision. And then the concept, the only word that's shared between the two, communities or community. We are and must always remain focused on being a college of the community, responsive to the community, representative of the community, meeting the needs of the many different communities that we serve. The strategic plan we'll unveil today, uh, I believe is, is true to that. Our student experience statement, Arizona Western College commits to delivering an amazing student experience characterized by a connected community where students are encouraged, challenged, and feel they belong. Flexible, accessible services and learning approaches. Programs developed and aligned with employment opportunities. Clear paths to success and completion. Contemporary technology that supports and enhances the AWC experience. Let's take a look at this, because I think it's an important, it's, I love the word commits. We are committing to our students an amazing student experience. Um, first and foremost, we have to remain focused on the student experience and the needs of our students. And as an institution, part of this process, very early in the process, we created what, what, what the student experience will be. And it's all these things, okay? connected, where they will feel belonging. Remember, two-thirds of our students are first generation. Some arrive to us uncertain whether they belong in college. We commit, very powerful word, to making sure they feel connected and supported when they walk through our doors. We commit that they'll have the appropriate technology to facilitate their learning. We commit that our programs will be aligned to workforce needs. Be a, we commit 
to establishing and maintaining a clear path to, to, uh, to completion. And we commit to flexible and accessible support services. I've never, part of, I've never been part of an institution that overtly made a commitment to the students and the experience that they will have when they walk through that door. That's a challenge for all of us to remain focused on each day. Again, it all begins with our students. And at this point, I'd love to hear from a couple of our students. And um, uh, my thanks to, uh, I, I think, Ellen Reek, who, who arranged for a couple of students to be with us. I hope you're not missing class. If you are, we'll write you a note or something, uh, and, and hopefully that, that, that will work. But first, uh, it, it's my honor to welcome uh, up to the stage Aymara Farfan, who's going to share some thoughts with you. And she will be follow, followed by Sarazi Meza to share a few thoughts with you. So, um, uh, Aymara? Good morning, everyone. A little nervous. Uh, my name is Amaya Farfan. I'm currently an AWC student and hoping to do a major in uh, psychology and public health. I chose to study at AWC uh, because it offers affordable classes and extremely flexible schedules. I feel we as a community college are more inclusive and have a lot of resources that our staff make sure never going used. It's also the community college my family has attended, so it only felt right, which is why I'd like to share a little quick history of my family with you today. Change is never easy, and for my grandparents, that was as clear as day. My grandfather was a successful mechanic who owned his own shop in uh, San Luis, Mexico. His lifelong passion was playing baseball, and in fact, he was one of the original baseball players for the first professional baseball team in Mexico, known as Algodoneros. After marrying his childhood sweetheart, they had four children, uh, their oldest son showed the same passion in baseball, but knew he wanted more. That's when my grandparents knew they had to make some changes to their lives. For them, migrating to the United States meant losing everything. My grandmother was the first to earn her citizenship around 1984, and my grandfather earned his shortly after. Their sacrifices were destined to do one thing, and that was just to simply impact their children's lives for the better. My grandmother found employment here and there, and eventually found a steady uh, job as a custodian at Gila Ridge High School, up until this last year when she recently retired. My grandfather worked up until his body and loss of good vision could no longer allow him to, yet they were successful in reaching their goal. Their oldest son, my uncle, Jorge, became a teacher, a baseball coach, and founded the m &J Yuma Baseball Academy. Though he has recently passed away, every year at the Cecil Fielder Baseball Tournament, the city of Yuma will continue to honor his contributions to our city by dedicating a championship trophy after his name. Their second oldest, Marco Jaime, was assistant coach and also worked at Gila Ridge as a groundskeeper. My mother, Fatima, pursued a career in the medical field and to this day continues to expand her studies. Their youngest child, Marcy, earned a degree in education. And although attending college at an older age isn't easy, especially with language barriers, that didn't stop both of my grandparents from attending a year AWC in order to strengthen their uh, English speaking skills. And my grandfather also worked hard to earn an air conditioning mechanics uh, certificate. They all live pretty comfortable lives and are extremely thankful that they have the chance to enjoy the opportunities that this country has to offer. Their success didn't come easy. There were many obstacles along the way. The one piece of advice I cherish the most is advice that my late uncle Jorge once shared with me. He always reminded me of the importance of education and how without it, you basically set yourself up for limitations. I certainly can say that I myself am beyond grateful for the decisions my parents and grandparents have made. Thanks to them, I am where I am now and have the ability to pursue any dreams I dream. That to me sounds like what the American dream is all about. And education is everything to me, and Arizona Western College makes it easier to be a student today. We as a community continue to strive for a better future for our upcoming generations that will turn around and help flourish Yuma County. Arizona Western Strategic Planning offers us a new vision of excellence and endless possibilities for generations to come by reminding us of the importance of education and how it can change our world. My family's history has benefited greatly from the values, opportunities, and never-ending strive towards success that this college has offered for decades. And for that, we thank you. Thank you.
First off, I want to thank everyone who took part in planning and finding ways to better the students' experiences and along the way building a stronger campus. When I was first asked to speak at this event, I was very surprised, <laughs> but I saw this as an opportunity to share a little bit of my story. Let me introduce myself. My name is Sarai Mesa Ruiz, <clears throat> and I, this is my second year attending AWC. I am majoring in nursing with a minor in arts. I'm also an alumni of the College Assistant Migrant Program, which has helped a lot of migrant families get a strong and successful first year experience by allowing them the opportunity to live on campus and providing tutoring and great academic guidance. Being part of camp provided me with multiple opportunities from attending statewide conferences with state representatives and being able to form strong connections with my professors and communities and attend attending events just like this. Camp showed me support through every, each one of my classes and built me to be a proud and strong first year generation student. Coming from a farm working family, I have always been taught that nothing is handed down. Everything is earned. And earning an education has always been very important to me, to not just push myself forward, but my family. And despite all the financial and academic hurdles in my life, coming to AWC, I always felt welcomed and not labeled. As kids, I think we can all agree, we have been told education is the way to being successful. But we aren't told just how hard and time consuming it will be. Finding a place that allows us to feel safe and free to learn to the best of our abilities is usually the hardest decision we make as we catch ourselves at one point leaving high school where everything was planned for us. Attending the Horizon Symposium back in April of 2017 allowed me to see how en engaged and concerned AWC's faculty, staff were about, and Dr. Core <laughs> were about, especially Dr. Core. <laughs> <laughs> We're about ensuring a great future for its students, for its variety of students in this campus. Just like the faculty and staff, as a student, I can agree we all want the same thing, a better tomorrow, better jobs, and a higher level of self-worth and opportunities. So why Arizona Western College? All those who step foot on campus leave with a small piece of AWC, due to the sense of peace and the welcomeness it brings to each of us. As a student here, I want to not just become an alumni, but I want to say that I was proud of being a part of the team that pushed and continues pushing towards its student success through the mission of transforming lives through education and partnerships to create thriving communities. This strategic plan, I believe, will ensure of not having the stigma of just a community college, but a thriving education center treated with respect. Thank you for your time, and I hope you see the benefits in availing this strategic planning. How wonderful were they, huh? Another round of applause for our students. So here we go. Strategic directions of the college. This is kind of the framework uh, for for what we're what we're embarking on, and you'll see very deliberately at the bottom. Uh, it is built on a foundation of of our mission, our dynamic, powerful mission, uh, with with students being that that very first and most important layer. Um, our strategic directions on 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 banners behind me and I'll, I'll I'll walk us through them here in 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 some level of detail in in the next 15 minutes or so are agility technology accessibility and prosperity and of course our vision and our values our institutional values uh, Im impact all of them in very broad strokes and again, they'll, they'll, I'll, I'll walk through in some detail. And by the way, you don't need to take notes or take pictures or whatever else. Everyone's going to be able to walk out with a booklet where all this will be uh, outlined for you. So um, uh, no, no need to do that in, unless you really want it. Um, so agility. We commit to creating a culture, an agile culture. Um, technology. Okay. We know. 
uh, that at current, our current state, we are at deficit. We commit to not, uh, not moving to, uh, to, to the standard, but moving to this to be a strength for this institution and our students. Accessibility. We're committing to eliminating the cultural, financial, time and place barriers to education and prosperity. That we will grow and sustain the appropriate programs and competencies that will fuel economic growth and prosperity for our graduates. Let's take a look at these one at a time. Agility. Okay. We need to, we need as an institution, in order to go from good to great, create a governance structure that is much more agile where all voices um, are, are heard and the decision-making process is significantly more decentralized. In effect, we need to unleash the power, the brilliance, the skill set, the ideas, and the passion of everyone in this institution and everyone in this community to be part of a, of a, greater, a greater college. Towards that end, we will, in very short order, review all policies, procedures, practices of the institution, and again, streamline, not only for the efficiency of employees, but for the efficiency and effectiveness of our students. How does one become a student at AWC? What barriers, if any, exist? Are we truly uh, scheduled and organized, and, and our, our processes facilitate a seamless and welcoming entry in, into our college. And for the employees, are, 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 do we have procedures that actually um, prevent us from better serving our students? We'll need to do this from top to bottom and again towards an eye of unleashing the power and expertise of, of everyone in this room and the people not in this room to better serve our students. That means we're gonna invest in our people. We'll, we will have to become more nimble and flexible in terms of the, the training of our employees so that they can serve multiple functions to, 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 to better serve our students in a more efficient way. That will require funding professional growth opportunities. We hear a lot in Yuma and La Paz County that, oh, we have difficulty uh, um, uh, attracting these type folks to our institutions. Well, then we'll need to grow our own. We'll need to invest in ourselves so that there is a streamline and to, to fill positions and that we're building bench strength as, as we go along. In short, we must be what higher education is very much known not to be. Agile, flexible, responsive. In many ways that means unburdening ourselves of the ways of the past and taking a look at are there better ways to do things? Is that process necessary? Is there a different way to do that? Is there a more student-centric way to do that? Is there a more efficient way to do that? And we're committed to, to doing just that. Technology. You know, I've heard from, uh, as, as we went through, tech, technology, is that really a, a, a strategic direction? Isn't that just something something we do? Isn't that just part of life? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. If we, if we are going to make that move from good to great as an institution, we're not merely moving ourselves out of deficit. We're not merely making our email more responsive and our systems more stable. That's, 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 a, that's a starting point. That's not aspirational by any means. That's, that's just operational and things that we're, we need to do and are doing. But what we're talking about with this strategic direction is delivering an updated current technology that supports our student services, that supports appropriate pedagogy, that supports student learning, that supports teaching and learning, supports our faculty, supports everyone else in this room who is here to help our students, supports people in the community as they try to access uh, the college. Okay. Some really important things that we need to do to be, again, a leader in this region, a leader among community colleges in, in, in technology as a, as a way of helping get that done. Here's one I want to spend a little bit of time on, access. 
right? If, 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 if we are truly going to create thriving communities, vital communities, if we are going to transform lives, before we can transform lives, we need those students here, and we need to remove the barriers to their access to this institution and success at this institution once they get here. So we are committing to establishing a data-based, uh, data-driven class schedule that aligns with program offerings and transfer workforce demands. I will tell you right now, we need to eliminate a waiting list. If, a stu if there is a student need for courses, we need to be able to deliver those courses. Putting students on waiting lists is not, not okay. I didn't know that was gonna be an applause line, but all right. <laughs> Feel free to do that whenever you hear something you like. <laughs> Open educational resources, OER. Um, we've got to do more. Uh, the cost of a book is often a barrier to enrollment for many of our students. We've done this remarkable thing. Our, our district governing board had tremendous courage when last October they approved the $25 a credit hour uh, tuition rate for students under the age of 18. Okay? And we have since tripled the number of students under the age of 18. Remarkable. A 300, just short of a 300, I'll call it, I'll round up to 300%, a 300% increase in the number of students under the age of 18. But you know that I have heard literally dozens of times from folks who said, I was really excited because I thought I could take a course for about $75, and then I realized that the book was, was $175, and I wasn't able to swing that, and that was really disappointing. That has to stop. So I challenge our faculty to work together collectively uh, with institutional support to investigate and adopt open educational resources that can make access to this institution and higher education more affordable to students. Let's remove the barrier of the cost of books from education at Arizona Western College. You know, I love going down to South County. You've heard me say that. I love going down to San Luis and Summerton. There's magic going on down there. There is a desire for more. They want the college to step up and deliver more services, more courses, have more faculty. And they, our largest feeder high school, in terms of percentage of the graduating senior class, San Luis High School. Okay? We must, as an institution, address the needs of the learners in South County, especially those who, who are challenged with transportation. It's not as easy as saying, well, you just gotta get yourself up here to Yuma if you wanna do that. That's not always possible, and, and the bus transportation is a challenge, and, and the gaps between classes is a transportation. We have to do more in South County. I've said that publicly. Now, as an institution, we are committing to, to providing the appropriate resources to expand our footprint in South Yuma County, whether that's San Luis or Summerton or both. <laughs> Time to completion, right? It, it, it's wonderful when we get our students here. We need them to be able to complete, and we need them to be able to complete in greater numbers, and we need them to be able to complete faster. When they, are, when they are capable, academically capable of doing so. So we commit in this strategic plan to providing the appropriate wraparound resources and support services that we will reduce the time to completion among our students. They need to be here, access, but then success. And this, this strategic goal speaks to that. Guided pathways. You've heard me speak about this a couple of different times, and you'll see that the timeline here, and all these timelines have been, uh, uh, they're, they're staggered, but they're thought out, and obviously it takes the complexity of the goal as to what that timeline um, it, it has been established. Um, but we are committed to creating guided pathways that will integrate the learning experience and provide the support so that students, when they come in, see that clear and defined path to their completion, and that their student experience as a whole creates something that is greater than all the parts that went into it. 
And then here's one that I think is, is the last bullet point here, just tremendously ambitious. The majority of our students come to us academically unprepared in one subject or, or another for college level work. Okay. I'll just stop and, and, and walk the, through this with me. Imagine you're that student first generation, okay, two thirds of our students. Perhaps your English is your second language, 55% of our students. Perhaps you come from a place of poverty. 22% okay, of our students come with family incomes of less than $20,000 family incomes. You muster the courage and the self-confidence to walk through our door and, and announce that you're ready to attend Arizona Western College. We give you an assessment test as is appropriate. And the first thing we tell you as an aspiring student at this institution, you're not quite ready. We're gonna, we're gonna, you need to take some developmental education. You know, you, you got to have that appropriate groundwork. Let's shift that experience back to the high school. Let's make sure with our high school partners, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm with our high school partners, let's make sure that we're testing all of our feeder high school students in the junior year, identifying their, what remediation is needed and taking care of it when? During the senior year. So that greater numbers, if not all students, arrive to us ready for the rigors of college level work. We're not lowering the standards by any means, but we're saying we will identify and remediate college level deficiencies, not when you walk through this door, but prior to it, in conjunction with our high school partners. You know what? No one in the state of Arizona is doing this. We have committed to working with our high school partners to doing this. This is a game changer and will be inspiring to students who understand that that senior year is being spent preparing for their Arizona Western College experience. Let's think big. Let's, let's turn the whole educational system on its ear and let's eliminate that gap between high school and Arizona Western College. Let's blur that line. I feel at this point I've given short shift to agility and technology, but I, 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 have a, I have kind of an interest in access, but they're all important. I love them all equally. Just that one a little bit more. <laughs> Prosperity. Um, again, we, we, we aspire to be central, a driving catalyst to creating economic growth regionally, collaborating with our key business and industry partners, developing programs that are responsive to current employee deficit in this region. Whether that's through internships and apprenticeships, grow your own programs, customize training, whatever that looks like, we need to be a catalyst in regional economic growth and prosperity. Towards that end, we will develop new programs as appropriate that will fit local industry needs. Again, using the flexible delivery models. Again, partnering, right there, central to our mission with the appropriate industry and, and workforce groups that will help uh, alleviate employee deficit and skill gaps in this region. We'll have to look into, and we commit to looking into ways where we can, um, where we can really give credit for experience that has been learned elsewhere. We, we're here in Yuma with, with, with two large military bases. They do a great job of providing skills and training how do we translate that into college level credit outside the traditional CLEP model? How do we go about creatively recognizing skills and abilities of students that they come to us with and turning that into appropriate college credit? And the development of institutional learning outcomes. What does it mean? What institutionally, what, what is an experience or education here at the college? And again, that with a we're well along that path, and, and that has a shorter than most time frame later this fall, later this year in the fall. All of this culminates with the BHAG. Okay. That's a big, hairy, audacious goal. Okay. And this 
This also, if we are going to truly create thriving communities, if we're truly going to transform lives, if we're going to eliminate poverty, all those big things, we need to have a big goal, and it starts with doubling the number of adults holding a baccalaureate degree in Yuma and La Paz County. Now, as I've shared this, people will say, whoa, whoa, Arizona Western College doesn't offer baccalaureate degrees. How can, how can you as a community college state as, as an institutional goal that you will double because we will be the catalyst? We will be the driver of this ambitious goal. We will partner with the, with the wonderful, dedicated high school partners that we have. We will reach up to the wonderful, dedicated partners that we have at the U of A, NAU, and ASU. And, and we will be the catalyst. We will drive a community-wide, a region-wide process that will double the number of adults with baccalaureate degrees. I will tell you right now that Yuma and La Paz County, adults age 25 and older, 14% hold a baccalaureate degree. 14%. In the state, that's 26%. In the nation, that's 29%. We have some work to do. But we're thinking big. As a college, as the people in this room, with our partners, as a region, we will, by 2035, double the number of our friends and neighbors who hold a baccalaureate degree. That's the BHAG. Keep it in mind, because we're going to do it. You know, this has been a long process. We're about 12 months into it. And uh, we, at one point, when we were sitting around, we, before we even got started, knowing we needed to do some strategic planning, we're thinking, do we just do this ourselves? Can, do, do we have the bandwidth to kind of pull this together? Or might we need some help from the outside? And that was a critical decision that led us to the success of this plan and where we're at today, because we arrived pretty quickly that we needed some expertise. And uh, we, we sent out a request for proposal and, and, and different in, uh, folks were interviewed. And I will tell you, we struck gold. We hit a home run when we decided to, to, to bring uh, Liz Murphy and Campus Works on board to help us through this conversation. Liz knew that she did not know Arizona Western College and did not know Yuma and never tried to impose on this college or this region what she felt was best. But she asked the tough questions, put us in uncomfortable situations by asking those tough questions, and always kept us focused on the end goal. So it's my pleasure to bring to the stage to share a few words and thoughts, Liz Murphy. Good morning, everyone. Normally, I'm the rabble rouser, but I think this morning, President Corr has done such an exceptional job. He's truly left me um, incredibly emotional. <laughs> I've been standing there for about five minutes saying, pull it together, because you have work to do up here. Um, many of your faces I've seen so many times. And the first few times I saw them, you're like, lady, what are you up to? And are we really going to get anywhere with this process? And um, I love this picture of your tree that you planted during the kickoff. This is that tree. I looked at it a couple times over the last week and didn't even realize it. I thought it was clip art from Bing Images. And then I recognized the building, and I said, look at them flourishing. Absolutely amazing. Remember the vision exercise we did? Turn, 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 turn. Many of you were here for that, for that visioning exercise. Now you've gone from believing that you could imagine the future to having imagined the future. And it has been probably one of the highlights of my 35 years in higher ed to have been partnered with you on that journey. What I have learned about this community, about your special challenges, 
about your neighbors in Mexico and about what you can do in the world will motivate me forever. And I thank you for that very much. Okay, now it's time to do my job. So, um, when we started, we talked about the fact that one of the huge values of strategic planning is going through a process where you make choices. And choices aren't easy, and I have to say in higher education, we're a little afraid to make choices. You know, how many times have we been in a situation where we say, you're right, we really need to do that, but we're not going to take anything off the plate to do that. Because you know what, we're a little afraid that what we take off the plate will be the thing we really need. We're afraid we won't make our enrollment numbers. We're afraid that the money won't be there. We're afraid of so many things in the process. What I've seen from all of you, and I include those of you who have participated in this process from the larger external community in this region, is you've gotten braver and more courageous as time has gone by. And you've easily aligned to the things that are important to you. It wasn't hard to develop the strategic directions because by the time you got there, you were clearer about what was important. And then it was a matter of prioritizing the objectives and narrowing them down so that you could actually achieve. So my remarks and my coaching today are really about what is it going to take to achieve that big, hairy, audacious goal and that vision. It isn't going to be easy, but you've taken the first step. You've made the choices. And you've learned some things along the way. I encourage you, don't stop using some of the tools and techniques that we've used throughout this process. Think about, I, I know my, my partners on the board, they never imagined how much progress they could make in 75 minutes, right? Look, eh, eh, Olivia's going, yeah, I know, I thought she was crazy, right? Think about how much work we got done together sometimes in 90 minutes, in 60 minutes, because we used a group process. The, the secret is that was the plan. The plan was not only to get you to a strategic plan that you could be absolutely enthused and passionate about, but also to teach you some ways to get all the voices heard, synthesize what those voices were saying, and then focus on priorities, because that isn't over. Life around us is going to continue to happen. What happens in the world is going to affect some of your decisions, and you might have to tweak and align to some changes in the environment. Use some of what you've learned in this process to keep coming back together. Keep listening to each other. Don't be afraid of the difficult conversation. And what I've said to you so many times, don't be afraid to push on the bruise. Sometimes that little flinch causes you to see things a little bit differently. That's been my job, to help you to get there, but now you all know how to do it. So trust each other. Trust that you are aligned around the same things. You got here together. You're unified. Assume from the outset that everybody wants the same thing and it is what is in this plan. And then have healthy dialogue and debate to get yourselves there. There's a tremendous amount of discipline that comes into the next part of this process. <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of really pretty strategic planning documents that never accomplished anything. So my encouragement to you is focus on function, not form. But to get there will take discipline. It will take being accountable. It will take honesty and transparency to say, we're not making the progress we thought we would make. Here are the honest reasons why. 
We just couldn't get to it because we have these other things. Okay, let's stop and figure that out. What can we do about those other things? Do we really need to realign? Do we need to tap the deadline a little? What do we need to do? But keep talking about it through the process. Because as you'll see from one of the sources I'm gonna quote later, you know, um, execution is where most strategies go to die. The absence of execution is what causes these really amazing, impactful, empowering, inspirational strategic plans to not actually go anywhere. And 10 years from now, you're kind of the same as you were before. I truly do not see that here. But what it's going to take is your ability to stay engaged, your ability to say no. So you do have a problem with that. You are so focused on service that sometimes you mistake service for what should be discipline. You can't say yes to everything. If you had an unlimited budget, you still couldn't say yes to everything. Your strategic plan is designed to allow you to frame what it is you're going to do, to focus it. Now, for those of you who are sitting there saying, I'm not sure how what I do every day ended up in one of those objectives. The operations of the college still have to happen. The strategic plan is about those things that are going to bring you higher, take you to a new level. And so when you're choosing new things to invest in, you must first look to your strategic plan and those objectives. That's where your time and energy has to go. And in as much as your operations align with those strategic objectives and these strategic directions, you're going to be wildly successful. But it's not a thing you're going you're gonna to be real excited the first six months. You're going to be sending out all the metrics, red, green, yellow, stoplight diagrams. Everybody's going to be reading the website. It's going to be all cool. Then you're going to go away for the summer. And you're going to come back. And you are going to be tempted, like going off your diet, you are going to be, how many of you had that? It's January, so it's tis the month of going off the diet. I never got on it, so it's, you know. Um, I just thought, well, you know, July 1's a new year, too. So. <laughs> so, so when you come back, you need to be thinking about how do we keep the discipline? And you know what? That's, that's what you rely on your cabinet for. And board members, that's what we're relying on you for. You ask the hard questions. You hold people accountable. Don't make it easy to not achieve. Don't make it easy on each other to not achieve. Respect and honor the power of what you're creating. I mean, I listened to those students and I thought, holy cow, we can't let you down, right? We can't let you down. We can't let your children down. And how about all those family members who never get the chance? You have to make it different. So when you lose sight of it, when you're tired, when you're frustrated, those are the people. So Dr. Kaur's commitment to always having students engaged will continue to be a really important thing for all of you. So why do strategic plans fail? Um, well, the, the, the symptoms are, you know, not everybody's on board and people aren't held accountable. So that's the most common expression of why they fail. But what's, those are just symptoms of why strategic plans fail. They really fail because we start to avoid uncomfortable truths. We get afraid to say what's really happening, whether it has everything to do with our performance or our limitations, or it has to do with someone else's. Normally, we're a lot better in higher ed about realizing our shortcomings, but we're really uncomfortable having a difficult conversation with a peer, particularly somebody we like going to lunch with or you know, sits on the same committee as me. Um, I like to say to my teams, we're not dating, we're working together. 
So there's a big difference, right? And so have enough respect for each other that you're willing to say, you know, Liz, I, I really was counting on that. And because I don't have that from you, we're struggling as to what we can do next. What can we do together to get you to that place? Present it in a way where the dialogue gets opened up and don't avoid the uncomfortable truths. You have a president and a cabinet that are very willing and continuing to work hard together to be open to everything they're hearing and figuring out what to do about it. Now, they can't run around and take care of all your individual little knit things, right? But they put it together and they synthesize it and they say, this is a theme, this is a trend, we gotta take care of that. Keep it coming, listen to the voices, be one of those voices and hold each other accountable. Um, is it feasible? If you're running into a problem on the way to accomplishing an objective, why is that? Maybe there's a big thing we didn't realize. Maybe on the way to a huge technology advancement, we discovered that some of the underlying infrastructure was really bad and we didn't know that before. Just talk about it. Let's talk about it, let's adjust, let's say what is the result of that, right? Have the real conversations. Spend time on what's impactful. Don't get yourselves wrapped around the axle on the things that are out here, right? It's really easy to do that. That is the power of some of the group process you've been through in the strategic plan. You notice how people got to give their voice, but we didn't spend a lot of time on the white noise. Why? Because there were so many voices that were aligned that together you came to a similar place. Not always exactly, but there was a healthy respect for where you ended up in the process. Keep that going. And then finally, it does matter what comes first. So Dr. Kaur referred to sort of the timeline on some of the objectives that you saw. There are predecessors to certain things. And so if you find that there's a weakness that has to be overcome before you can take the next step, talk about what that is and think about it. Please, you've been so good about being thoughtful Avoid ready, fire, aim. It's easy to do that. You get excited, you see it, it's so close, let's skip a bunch of steps. I'm not talking analysis paralysis. Sometimes, though, you do need to go slow to go fast. There are things you have to take into consideration to be successful. Um, one last thing I want to share with you is about mental models. And this is really important in terms of how you deal with each other in this process. Um, this article from Harvard Business Review talks about those of us who are strategic, have a strategic mindset, and those of us who have an implementing mindset. And for a lot of you, you encountered that in our group discussions, right? You'd be at a table and somebody'd be like, Whoosh, in the stratosphere, you know, let's have a, let's have AWC on Mars and here's what we're going to do. And it's, you know, it's really out there. And the other person's like, you know, uh, we don't understand what the trajectory is going to be. Can we see that math? Can we have that? Right? So some people are implementers and some people are visionaries. We need them all. So, for those of you who have been more visionary, you might have enjoyed this part of the process a lot more. Like, oh, let's blue sky it. Liz says we have no budgetary limitations. We can have all the people we want. Let's make a plan. Well, now you're in a position where you actually have to do what you set out to do. You need to embrace the implementers. And they're going to be asking you some nasty, hard, downer questions. Like Sharus, maybe. <laughs> Like, how are we going to pay for that? And that's such a great idea. Where's that coming from? What money are you giving up? How's that going to happen, right? So, so what I'm saying to you is you need to find a way to coexist because failure to honor both models will lead you nowhere. So, Sharus can't throw a wet blanket on your great idea, but he can challenge you to answer some questions about Tell me how I can help you. I'm sure what he means to say is, tell me how I can help you make that happen. <laughs> right? 
I once had the pleasure of um, hearing the CFO of Disney speak to a group of community college business officers. And he said, you know, you'd think my job was cool because I'm with Disney, but he says, imagine these Imagineers come in, that's what they call their engineers, these Imagineers come in and it's, a, it's an anniversary in the uh, Orlando Park. And they're like, we have a great idea, boss, <laughs> really great idea. We want to turn the castle into a giant cake for the anniversary. And, and he says, so what's this have to do with me? Well, here's the thing. And they pull out these drawings, and they have all these inflatable things. And if any of you had the pleasure of seeing it, it was mind-blowing. It looked like a giant gingerbread house, and it cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. And he said, my job is not to say that's not happening. My job is to say, let's talk about how to make that happen. And that was very powerful to me, right? So you need to hear the voices of the people who are talking about the nits. You know, those people who every time you're on a roll, they stick the pencil in the wheel and you go, oh, my God, really? We're going to spend time talking about that? You need those people now. Because those things are the things you're going to have a problem with later. It's not just money, but it's all the little details, right? So those of you who are detail-oriented, you need to meet them. You need to meet the visionary strategy people halfway. Strategy people, you have to have patience, and together you have to reach a pace and a rhythm where you're getting things done. Please avoid the temptation of analysis paralysis. What have we learned in this process? Some of you should be able to quote this, particularly on the task force. It's better that you should choose something than to worry too much about choosing the wrong thing. Because focusing and making a choice leads you to greater success than choosing nothing. One last thing. Measurement will be an important part of managing the strategic plan. And I don't just mean red, green, yellow, but I mean really understanding what's happening in process, not at the end. Some of these goals are really far out, right? And so it's not like, let's hang out till 2022 and see if we do anything. Uh, that is really not how we're successful, right? So we need the incremental pieces to make sure that it happens. And don't wait for the big measurement. What this means, uh, foc I love this, focus on the learning and the creation of network effects. So what's the measurement that when we hit that measurement, we know it's like it, it has this explosive kind of reach. And that's what we're looking at, right? And don't be afraid of measurement. Most important thing I'm going to tell you today, and I already see it, is you're not afraid of big goals. Your BHAG says that. This is not going on your permanent record. So stop worrying about, are we actually going to make that number? And let's pick a conservative goal, because I want to make, everybody wants to make the number. But you know what? Your action plans are driven by the goals you set. So if you have wimpy goals, you're going to have wimpy action plans. You might have really good action plans that get wimpy results. Think, continue to think big and measure along the way. You know, at the heart of all this is how you get it done. And so uh, this next part of the program is really about what you, as an AWC community, have created in terms of your values. And the values will drive your success. Agility. 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 We welcome change. Anticipate stakeholder needs. Identify flexible and innovative solutions. Adapt to meet constituent needs. And are process focused. Passion. 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 We dream big. Propose creative solutions. Exceed expectations and foster an engaging and supportive environment. Transparency. 
Transparency. Transparency. Transparency. Transparency. Transparency. Transparency. We build trust through honesty and openness. Include stakeholders in decision making and communicate thoughtfully and clearly. Unity. 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 We collaborate to develop and achieve goals, find opportunities to create synergy and empowerment, and work holistically towards student success. Empowerment. 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 We are inspired to do our best work when governance and responsibility are shared equitably. Individuals are encouraged to express diverse and innovative perspectives. And courage is esteemed over comfort. Respect. 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 We express the highest levels of professionalism and kindness. Seek common ground with openness and inclusivity. Challenge ideas with empathetic mindset and listen to and acknowledge others' ideas with civility and courtesy. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Respect. That was awesome. Liz, where are you? Liz, thank you so much. Please stand, please stand. So we got about uh, two or three minutes to go here and I wanna, I wanna let you know that what we've, what we've laid out today is just the bare bones. Um, there's a lot of hard work that really begins now. The details, the implementation plan. Um, uh, sweat in the details. How do we get to this ambitious goal? And, and I, would, uh, I would ask that all of us keep, keep an eye on the end goal, find a way to yes when you're asked to participate in the next week or two. There'll be an all call that will be put out. We will, we will put together teams for each of these four strategic directions. Each team will be comprised of, of, of faculty members, classified staff, and professional staff. We need all voices heard. Okay, so when, when that call comes out, find a way to make time in your schedule to be part of, of this. Be part of transforming this institution. And you know what, there's, there's, there's a roadmap, if you will, for the success um, of, of this plan, and it came out with our Strategic Innovation Fund. And, and you'll remember that we wanted to, because the commitment from the beginning was our budget will reflect our strategic priorities. We will at this institution put our dollars where our strategic directions have been identified. But we were put in the situation where there was all this work being done and we knew we couldn't put, uh, you know, the next fiscal year doesn't start till, till July, five months from now. So we wanted in between to keep the momentum going and we put out a call for uh, ideas that could tap into a strategic innovation fund. Something that I, I think was new to the institution and hadn't been experienced before and frankly we didn't know what we'd receive. But you know what we received? Unbelievable ideas. We received unbelievable ideas that we were able to fund from the Yuma campus from the San Luis campus, from the Summerton campus, from the downtown campus, from the Parker campus. We got ideas that came from faculty. We got ideas that came from classified staff. We got ideas that came from professional staff. And you know what? We came and we got ideas and funded ideas that came from students. And as a result, there's some really dynamic and wonderful projects underway right now, and it shows the power of this institution when we put out a call for all voices to be heard and understand that ideas come from everywhere within this institution, including students and our communities that we serve. At this point, I really do want to ask and, and recognize uh, all the effort that went into this process from our task force and SCAN team members. If I could ask task force and SCAN team members to stand at this point. There's a full list 
of scan team and and hopefully everyone's getting one of these and you know the old teacher and me once you hand out something everyone stops paying attention and look at what's in your hand but uh all all the scan team and task force members are identified in in the book i will tell you i am encouraged i'm energized um i'm excited about the prospect of this institution uh i i believe that we collectively and with our community partners will in fact transform lives. We will create thriving and vital communities and we will in fact double the number of, of community members who have earned baccalaureate degrees. I would love to ask students. I have just been prompted very subtly. <laughs> if I could ask, and I know there were a number here earlier, if I could ask any students any students with us uh, today, if they could stand and be recognized. All right. Thank you. Um, again, in the next week or two, there'll be a call for folks who want to join one of these, one of these groups. Find a way to yes. People who, who might work for you, who ask permission to join one of these groups. I ask that managers and directors find a way to yes, that they can uh, be able to participate. One last time, because it is so very powerful to me, and I believe Will is, is the most dynamic vision uh, I've ever experienced. As we depart, and we have seedlings for you to keep the theme of, of, of growth uh, with you and in your yards and homes, um, but if I could ask you to join me as, as I read our vision. Are you ready? Cultivating generations who value knowledge, foster independence, eliminate poverty, and create vital and equitable and sustainable communities. We can do this together. It's a great day to be a matador. Thank you very much.